scripted, I'm much more improv. So it's much better to just be given a talking point and then again we'll open it up for any questions and things about this. So as you heard at the beginning, I mean I've worked in all the different mediums over a long period of time and have shown in galleries and owned galleries and ran retail business and published and done all those kinds of things. Um, and not necessarily because I deserve to have those things. It's about being in the right place at the right time and never learning to say no to anything, which is a good thing at times. But a passion of mine from my first mentor teacher, uh, a name uh, as an artist you wouldn't recognize because she never w nor wanted to market herself, was a lady named Margaret Stahl Moyer. And she instilled in a teenager uh, m many aspects around art. And one of them, after about a year of being mentored by her, she handed me a box of pastels when I showed up for a critique one day. And I knew what pastels were, but here was this whole big candy box, basically. And she said, what you're doing with your other mediums, you should play with pastels. And I mean, a whole love affair started that evening. And I think that, uh, speaking to the medium, anybody who really picks up a stick and starts playing with it is going to be seduced on some level. Because it's the most tactile of the classic fine art mediums. Uh, there is no brush that is holding the paint. And yes, we still feel. But, and there's no pen that's imparting ink or pencil leaving graphite marks or anything. It's, it's the hand with the pigment in your hand. And so the tactileness of how it's applied and what's done with it and then the varied surfaces that we end up using really opens up that floodgate. They were actually using spittle most of the time. It's a perfect binder. Rolling it into a stick that looks like, for the pastel is here, like a unison pastel to me, right? and applying it to a surface that had enough to hold it. So that long time affair with the medium, again, over 45 years, has currently found me in the volunteer position of serving as the president of the International Association of Pastel Society. So I did my current research. I actually left our executive director yesterday um, in Dallas. She flew home and I flew out here. And uh, so I, I did a little research because we keep getting societies on a daily basis now. And what began in 1994, when Urena Christie Tarver, California native, native lady here, decided to form an organization to pull the societies together. The resurgence in the medium in modern times began in 1973 in the other capable hands of a wonderful matriarch, Flora B. Gafuni in New York City, and she brought back the Pastel Society in New York and called it the Pastel Society of America, which still really reigns as number one, it's, it's kind of our number one society, and out of that every other society has born. When she founded this, she had four societies. And as of today, in the United States, we have 63 member societies and a few others that are coming on board because we do have certain requirements. Internationally, we're now standing at 19, and that is going crazy. There's more societies happening, and the proliferation of it out across the globe is just amazing. Uh, China being at the forefront, Spain is very active, of course, <coughs> it always has been. Australia is another major candidate, and Canada is doing its best up there as well in, in having societies coming up. So that brings us right now to 82 societies. And what IAPS represents are the societies. In a way, you could think of it as a trade union. We represent the societies, they represent their members. So what we're attempting to do, and uh, I know that your society is a member, and, and Lynn and Margaret and everybody here has been very involved from their first convention. They came back and formed the society, and that tends to be what happened, is we're pushing the promotion and education, which really, to me, was the predominant theme tonight, and is something that all of us um, have to do. You know, why did pastel fall out of favor? Well, historically, there were interesting reasons, like the French Revolution. <laughs> it was the most popular medium 
in France, in the court of the Louis, until the head is wrong. And when the guillotine fell and the masses took over, everything associated to the royal class was held in suspect. So the artists working in pastel quit. Some of them fled for their lives. And so oil then came back up as the number one medium. And so then it became Degas. And we all love Degas because he was more of a mad scientist, a little bit like Leonardo da Vinci. He loved the experimentation from piecing pieces of paper together to pushing the medium to what we see happening today. I mean, Degas working on his monotypes, if anybody had a chance to see that exhibit, even if you didn't research it and see what he was doing with that, playing with fluids, different surfaces, different tones, different ways of applying pastel, and said, this is a medium that has no bound. And that's really where we're at now. In fact, we're having a hard time, and I know this society and all of the societies we represent is having a hard time defining what is pastel. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I was speaking with one of the manufacturers of pastel from Europe, Karen Bosch, a legendary company, he, uh, I was talking with the rep and he says, we have all these things labeled pastel. And I was silent. And he says, what? And I said, well, it's not really pastel. I said, you're using the proper use of the word, which is paste. We don't own that. But pastel isn't even defined as soft pastel. In France, it's pastel, and that's all it is. Everything else is pigment in another stick form with oil or wax or something else in it. So the medium's popularity is still really on the rise. Um, uh, those of us that, and, and I would assume that some of you have seen this from the publication of the Pastel Journal, it will be its 20 year anniversary next year. Uh, in the hands of the ladies who founded that, to the ladies that I have spoke about and the legendary artists that have promoted the medium, we see its market share ever expanding. Uh, we had basically in the United States one brand, Rumbacher, and then we had Rembrandt being imported. Then all of a sudden, Sennelier came in, and now we almost have too many choices in the marketplace, and the yeah. same with surfaces. So pastel, I'm happy to report, this was part of my duty, was the state of the medium is doing very well, very well. Now people still go, oh, but it's so fragile. If you touch it, and there isn't any glass, yes. But beyond that, the fragility of pastel is really the surface that it's placed upon. So in educating, again, your clients and going back to, you know, even, even what the interior decorators and the architects and the people filling the space and the public, their nervousness shouldn't be there when it's properly presented. Its longevity can outperform most of the other fine art mediums. It's not, it doesn't crack, it doesn't yellow. Its fragility is only its surface. And that's why those, well, I visited the Met. And that room with the Degas is dim. Pastel must be fragile. No, his paper was fragile. He didn't use good paper. So it becomes our job to keep kind of in our way, just slowly pushing back and letting the public know. UV glasses made a big difference. So all of you marketing your own work, I know it's expensive, although it's come down now as market share rises, it's the way economics work, but it makes a huge difference because now you're not seeing the reflectiveness, so even the watercolors are jumping on board with that, and curiously, a lot of major museums are now framing their oils under UV glass because it helps to stop the pigments from fading due to ultraviolet light, which is everywhere. So that's helped pastel. The other thing that I've noticed that has helped pastel a lot, and again speaks to interior design in the presentation, trends come and go, but the trend of framing slightly more like we would compare to an oil painting has educated the public that it's fine art. And like this, and they go to an oil painting, it's because they're showing their bias of they don't really want to sell that piece because they may have to ship it and box it up. You don't want to be in that gallery. 
and you want to point that out to the gallery owner at the same time and work with them and educate them even around the shipping. Because once the client falls in love with the piece and then goes, oh, this is this isn't oil paint or acrylic, but you show it's pastel. And you've told them some of the things I've told you. Not as prone to fading, not as prone to cracking. It's framed under museum glass. This artist cares about what they're doing. They want that painting. They've fallen in love visually with it, and what we have to do is not talk them out of it. You know, we don't have to make it seem like it's a more fragile medium than it actually is. And that'll help a lot with that. There are large monumental pastels. Don Emerson, dear friend of mine from our, another Oregon artist, you know, it's ironic. I'm big, tall, loud, and obnoxious, and paint small, and she's tiny, petite, so it's huge in big pastels. And they're under glass, and she ships them, and we both have been fortunate to show in the same gallery for many decades, and she does very, very well with her work. It's because the gallery believes in pastel, so they market it well. So that's kind of the state of pastel from me. So if there's anything else you would like to ask me, I'm an open book, and as, I, as they well knew in asking me to do this, they said, we're not worried, you can always talk about something. <laughs> I, I tend to take that as a compliment. So. One place to be able to gather, it's, it's harder to get the education in your shop. Well, it takes more work. Not necessarily because everything you just talked about is universal to all forms of artwork. Perspective and drawing and value relationships, color harmony, <coughs> content. I mean, that's universal to representational art and even to abstract art. And those elements of design, you know, that we hammer off. So they're really universal to it. You know, and that, that's really the lovely part of this is that in a way it doesn't matter what medium you're using. That's why Margaret said to me, what, you're do what she meant was what she saw in how I was applying oil, I would probably love pastel. So you've got to separate the visual education of what we're doing in fine art. That's universal. And everything we paint is the same. There are, or my coffee table book that I wrote a few years ago was nothing but looking back and connecting the stories to artwork. And one of them dealt with that. That uh, working with a legendary artist that pointed out to a friend of mine that a still life is the same as a portrait. You know? And it's a charming story, but it's the truth. You know, my friend kept saying, you didn't show me how to paint a portrait. So it's all the same. Shape, value, color. So that education path you're on, that can come from varied media. You can, you can work with great people, and if they're truly an educator, it won't be medium specific around them, because it isn't. When we get to, in fact, one of my classic ways of starting a workshop is what I call the two T's, technique and theory. See, the theory is what we were just talking about, how the human eye sees, how the mind processes, symbolism is identity, in a representational painting, value represents depth and form and bulk, and color is really an emotional sensation that we then associate through nostalgic memory. And once you embrace that, then you realize that there are techniques, and that's a smorgasbord. But that's a smorgasbord in everything. I mean, look at watercolor. You have people that paint bold and wet and splashy, and people that work very delicate and controlled, and yet they're all working in watercolor and they're still drawing and dealing with value and color. And then the longer you paint, your own technique comes out. See, we don't buy it. That's the other innocence in the beginning, and you know, and everything I do came from figuring it out, was, you know, it's like, I wanna be a French Impressionist. Then somebody goes, well, try that. You know, oh, I wanna be this, try it. And then and people will say, I wanna style. They come to me all the time in a class. You have a style. I don't want a style. I go, my style keeps kind of morphing as I do. And style is something that once you form those other things, it just comes out naturally. Just like any performer, musician, author, whomever.